Okay, so just to respect everyone's time, uh, I want to say thank you very much and welcome to our Ag Policy and Your Farm webinar series. This is our, our third one of our series um, and our last one. So uh, I know there may be still some more people that are still coming and they, they'll be certainly able to, uh, to uh, sign in when, they, when they're available. Um, before we get started, I just thought I'd give a brief introduction about, about myself. I'm Roger Chevro. I'm the host for today. I am the chair of the Canadian Canola Growers Association, often referred to as the CCPA. I'm also the Region 11 Director for Alberta Canola, as well as the Chair for Alberta Canola. I am a fourth generation farmer and I grow wheat, barley, and canola on approximately 5,000 acres near Tillam, Alberta, with my father and my youngest son. And like I said today, earlier, I will be your host today. We are happy that you are able to join us today for the last session of our three-part agricultural policy webinars brought to you in partnership with our three prairie canola commissions, Alberta Canola, SAS Canola, and Manitoba Canola Growers Association. Before we get going into it, um, I, there's a few housekeeping things I want to discuss quickly with you. Um, this session is being recorded and will be shared on our CCGA's website after the event. For questions, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to ask your questions throughout the presentation. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll have time for, to review those Q&A questions. And, and if by chance we don't get through them all, we will uh, uh, post the answers on our website. So let's get started. One common goal among the Prairie Canola Growers groups is to provide solutions to government and industry on our policy issues that farmers face. And we advocate on farmers' behalf to the government at the municipal, provincial, and national levels. By working collaboratively with partners in the canola industry and other agricultural associations, we are able to have a stronger voice to impact change for farmers. The canola industry has two influential voices at the national level, the Canadian Canola Growers Association, which focuses on policies impacting farmers, and the Canola Council of Canada, which focuses on the full canola industry value chain. CCGA undertakes policy development on issues affecting canola farmers. CCGA's policy team works to affect change on behalf of Canada's canola growers through our research on and development of policy alternatives. We represent 43,000 Canadian canola growers on a national and international issues and ad advocate for grower interests through direct representation of parliamentarians, legislatures, legislators, and government officials. Just a little bit about our board of directors. CCJ's board of directors is comprised of 10 farmers that each provincial canola association appoints. The representation is three farmers from Alberta, three from Saskatchewan, two farmers from Manitoba, and one farmer from each BC and Ontario. And you can see the pictures of the board of directors on your screen right now. Today, we'll explore how to bring farmers' voices to the forefront of policy conversations in Ottawa. After two years of virtually advocating on behalf of Canada's canola growers, CCGA is back engaging with decision makers in person, but so is everyone else. Today, you'll hear from influence, hear how influence in ag policy requires more strategic and collaboration than ever before from Canada's most active lobby organization. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker for today, Mr. Dave Perry, CCGA's Vice President of Government and Industry Relations. Dave is responsible for leading CCGA's presence in Ottawa and developing and executing legislative strategies on behalf of Canada's 43,000 Canadian farmers. In 2021, Dave founded and now co-chairs the Agricultural Carbon Alliance, first of its kind coalition of 14 national farm groups focused on advocating on agro-environmental and sustainability policy issues, like Bill 234, which we'll talk more about today. And he also serves as a treasurer and member of the executive board of directors on the Canadian Agri-Food Trade Alliance, the CAFTA. At this point, I'll turn it over to Dave to get things rolling. Thank you, Roger, and uh, thank you for everyone for for participating today. It's um, uh, great to talk to you about uh, kind of what we do day in and day out. So um, the next 40, 45 minutes, uh, I'm going to offer you a view and hopefully uh, some insights, sort of from my perspective uh, as a professional full time lobbyist who, since leaving politics in 2012, has worked exclusively uh, on agriculture advocacy. 
Um, I'm going to cover off sort of four main areas today, and then I'll obviously leave time for, for Q&A. Um, so sort of lobbying 101, bit of, bit of set the stage there. Um, kind of Ottawa State of Play or State of the Union, kind of where are things in Ottawa? Uh, and uh, um, I'll, I'll try to unpack some, some of the big issues that we're working on behalf of uh, Canada's canola farmers. And lastly, the actual strategy and tactics and what we actually sort of do uh, to try to move the legislative needle forward. So lobbying 101, so what exactly is a lobbyist and what exactly is it we do is a question we get asked uh, a lot. Um, there are a few different kinds. Um, you know, a, a lobbyist is not a professional designation, uh, but um, the, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest cohorts would be consultants. And, and they're very much like, like lawyers. They represent uh, clients, whether those are companies or associations or charities. Um, they are typically kind of on retainer, but they represent uh, a variety of different parties and a variety of different issues. So they could, uh, in theory and in practice, do advocate uh, to the same member of parliament or same uh, minister's office on a variety of issues on behalf of a variety of clients. Um, if you watch TV, whatever your, your station of choice is, watch the news coverage, you also sort of see the pundits are talking heads. And those are often, um, you know, stylized themselves as conservative NDP or liberal strategists. Um, they certainly have interesting insight and comments on, you know, big political party issues uh, or in elections or the budget as will be coming up soon. Um, but they don't tend to actually be the ones doing the actual lobbying. Uh, they, they tend to have that sort of that more media side of the role. Um, the last is in-house lobbyists. And that means that's what we do, that, that's what I do. That means that uh, we work for whether an organization or a company, um, but you're there day in and day out on behalf of the same organization. Uh, maybe you've got a different hat on if you're in a board role, you know, Roger's got many board roles and I've got a couple, but you're there day in and day out uh, on behalf of the same uh, same people. Um, and while that sounds like maybe, you know, just difference in nomenclature, they actually are viewed very differently. Uh, for example, uh, the Stephen Harper government was very skeptical of consultant lobbyists uh, and was very open to engage with his uh, his cabinet to engage with in-house consultants, uh, consultant lobby, in-house sorry lobbyists, but was more reticent to sort of say uh, I think the optics of a minister um, getting lobbied by multiple multiple different um, uh, uh, stakeholders from one from one lobbyist. Uh, the Trudeau government has been less so. We've certainly seen an increase in lobbying activity that I'll touch on. Um, but it is just sort of important to know that in-house versus consultant lobbyists are viewed very differently. It depends on who the leader uh, or the prime minister is any time. Um, but we've certainly seen in, uh, consultant lobbyists certainly have uh, uh, more of a role than they would have under the uh, under the Harper government. So what is it we do, uh, you know, on a day-to-day um, you know, I guess in a nutshell, we do try to navigate you know, the public policy marketplace. There's that image up on, on your screen. Um, I will say, I know it looks confusing and convoluted. Uh, I'd suggest that that image is actually of like a well-functioning majority government, a well-functioning majority government, pre-social media, uh, you know, pre-pandemic, pre-24-hour news cycle. Uh, we're in a minority government, which further complicates all of it. So uh, it's an image I do like to use, though, because it does show the amount of different voices, uh, amount of different machinations that kind of come together um, and kind of try to influence uh, Parliament Hill. Um, my office, we're just one block south of Parliament Hill with the Supreme Court out, out my window. So we're quite close to the madness that can be the federal policy marketplace. Um, so on a day to day, you know, I spend most of my time talking to parliamentarians uh, and their staff. Uh, those conversations range from what you're trying to accomplish and what your baseline is. So that could be anything from an introductory conversation to get to know each other uh, and our issues, uh, relationship building, you know, kind of maintaining and fostering somebody maybe you've run into at a committee appearance or at a reception. Um, there's certainly high level advocacy about opportunities. Uh, and then uh, there's also meetings where you're there to raise specific, you know, the concerns or challenges we face with a very specific ask. And, I guess the reason that I, I kind of try to paint this picture is um, a, a meeting with a parliamentarian, they're not the same. There's very different reasons to go into that meeting, very different levels of understanding. Um, and, you know, I think it's very difficult to have a tough conversation with someone um, where you, you want something from them when there's no relationship in place. So we try to be as proactive as we can. This is a very reactive industry, but we spend a lot of time trying to build relationships and build those bridges so that we're not trying to build a bridge when there's a crisis. Um, so there are very different kinds of meetings. Uh, we often say if it's uh, uh, an introductory meeting uh, of CCGA with a parliamentarian, 
we got to cover the waterfront, right? We're there to explain who we are, our big policy issues, our economic impact. Um, then there could also be a meeting with, say, a member of the, the Agri House Agriculture Committee around a specific issue. And we can just forego all the introductions and the economic impact. And they know who we are. We're there to talk about a single issue. So they, they really do range uh, in the sort of so type and scope um, uh, of meetings that we request. Um, we also spend a lot of time working with other government relations policy and association staff. Um, you will certainly find that uh, in any government, but particularly minority government, uh, and I'll unpack that a little bit, is it's great if we have a great idea. Uh, if our policy team comes up with a fantastic idea uh, that, that, that we should advance on behalf of canola farmers, that's great. One of the first questions we'll always get asked is, what does everyone else think about this? We've had such a great idea. Why aren't others sharing in this opinion? So we spend a lot of time behind the scenes, behind closed doors, working with other groups uh, to try to present whenever possible a unified front. And I'll get into that. Um, um, you know, I'll get into that in a bit more detail, but th that's a very important part of it for sure. Um, you know, I think one of the defining features of CCGA, uh, this is the third in the webinar series, uh, is uh, our expertise with our policy shop and, and our communications and our government relations team. Uh, we have three full-time people here in Ottawa, uh, myself and Gail and Julia, um, and we are all former political staff. So it's something I think does give us a bit of a competitive edge where um, prior to, to joining CCJ, uh, at various points in our career, all three of us worked on Parliament Hill uh, as political staff. So we really understand what works well, what doesn't work well, and have been on the other side of the table when groups like ours have tried to advance policy priorities or objectives. Um, so that's certainly helpful. Um, so besides just the meetings, uh, you know, we participate in a lot of studies, uh, we draft submissions, uh, you know, reports, we engage in a whole host of working groups, committees, panels, roundtables. Um, as Sean Haney with Real Agriculture always likes to point out, uh, there certainly is the sort of lunch and reception circuit. Um, and, you know, we really could be when the House of Commons is sitting kind of at something every single night that there's an opportunity to engage in a more social setting. Try to limit that as as a, as, a, as a family man to try to do maybe one one a week. Um, but the other part of our job um, that's probably even less understood is there's there's rules around lobbying and engaging. Uh, we have a federal commissioner of lobbying. Um, so by the fifteenth of each month, we have to register every meeting we've had with someone that's a designated public office holder, which is someone essentially senior enough in the in the government apparatus that they have a direct sort of ability to influence policy. So. In a federal department, sort of an assistant deputy minister level, it gets more gray on the political side. You know, members of parliament and senators and ministers, very obvious. Um, but at the same time, um, members of parliament staff are not subject to designated public office holder um, requirements. So that means that anything that is prearranged, verbal, and that there's an ask of us, we have to register with the commissioner by the 15th of each month by subject matter and date of the meeting and who we met with. Um, Emails uh, do not do not are not considered lobbying. You can write an email about whatever you want because they are subject to ATIPS, which is an access to information and privacy request, which means the general public can try to source information that we're engaging with um, uh, with, with parliamentarians on. However, uh, emails to actual individual members of parliament are not subject to it. So it does get gray, but it is our job, the three of us here in Ottawa, to make sure that we're on the right side of all the lobbying rules. Um, so all that, you know, put into context is what, what are we trying to do? Uh, we're trying to advance policy issues with the ultimate goal of creating a legislative and a regulatory and a commercial environment that allows you farmers to do what you do best, whether that's grow crops, raise livestock, uh, a bit of both, but to focus on, 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 your, on your jobs, which is being Canada's farmers. Um, so we try to reduce red tape, uh, inform better policy programs and delivery. Um, Supporting good ideas, regardless of where they come from. Good policy is good policy. It doesn't matter which party or who brings it forward. Uh, and by the same token, pushing back on what we feel are bad ideas, regardless of the party or individual that brings it forward. Um, we really strive to be a reliable resource. Uh, we'll get into Ottawa being crowded. Um, but I think one of the things that, that we all strive to do in this, in this line of work is um, member of parliament and their staff need something. Uh, we hope they think of us and come to us for their questions, their their. Uh, their queries, they need information, they want to verify or vet something. Uh, we try to be that, that resource. And, and of course, to do that requires uh, building trust and building those relationships. This is certainly a, a relationship business. Um, we try to be at every table, which I'll, I'll describe later. Um, 
And then, you know, I think uh, another part that's really interesting is uh, risk management. And I'll get into it a bit later, but uh, often the absence of a loss is a win. Uh, so we really do try to, we don't get to choose the cards we're dealt uh, or, or the parties or the, the political structure or who's in power. Uh, but what we really do try to do is make the best of whatever situation uh, we come across. Um, and oftentimes that could be about delaying or, or softening the edges of things or things don't see the light of day. Um, things you don't communicate on social media, the real work of lobbying and advocacy uh, is done behind closed doors. Um, even here today, there's certain things I can share and certain things I couldn't because it would show that I don't have a good uh, you know, grasp of judgment and that, uh, you know, breaking confidences. So a lot of it is about uh, what you don't see on social media, things you cannot tweet or put in press releases. Uh, I'd suggest is real, where the real work is, uh, is done. So where are we in, in Ottawa? Ottawa sort of state of play. That's another image I, I kind of like. Uh, this uh, the image is, is not partisan any means. Uh, that, that could apply to any, any federal government. Um, but where are we today uh, in March 2023? Um, so we're approaching eight years of a liberal government, half of that which have been in a minority setting. So uh, minority governments are inherently um, higher tension. There, there's more stress. There's, they're more, less predictable. Um, and after eight years, you know, cracks start to form in any government, regardless of party, um, but certainly even more so, I, I'd suggest, under uh, with four years in the minority government. Uh, two years is sort of usually the lifespan of any uh, any individual minority government. Um, governments are their own worst enemy, for sure. Um, governments lose elections. Opposition parties don't win elections. It's usually governments that defeat themselves, uh, obviously not intentionally. Um, but that, that really is, the longer you're in government, the, the more cracks start to form, the more, more vulnerabilities, more mistakes are made. And uh, so that's just sort of where we are. Um, you know, I think we have seen a bit of a shift. Um, there certainly has been a kind of myopic focus for, for a period of time there around, you know, climate change, yes, but I, I'd suggest even more so on emissions reduction. Um, we're not seeing the same emphasis on, uh, on um, you know, water or soil as we are on uh, emissions reduction, whether that's, you know, GHG emissions uh, from fertilizer coming over a tailpipe from industry, you know, scope three emissions. Um, I'd say fall 2022, we did see a bit of a change there, um, likely because in the summer when MPs go home to their ridings, uh, we call it kind of the barbecue circuit. And I think all MPs of all parties uh, in the summer of 2022, uh, as they were out and about in, in their ridings, uh, heard from their constituents about uh, concern to the cost of living and inflation and monetary policy. Uh, and people may perhaps making tough decisions about their kids being in sports or at the grocery store or housing and those sorts of things. So I think we have seen the shift now more focus on monetary policy and economic uh, resilience and certainly more on um, kind of foreign interference and geopolitics um, with conflicts, but also with um, election meddling and, and those sorts of things. Um, so minority government brings opportunities, but also challenges. Um, so on the opportunity side, um, because there's no one group, uh, one party rather, uh, that has enough votes, that has 170 votes uh, in, in the House of Commons, there's 338 seats. Um, because no one party has enough votes, there are deals to be had, there are wins to be had. Um, it also gives us, from the outside looking in uh, as lobbyists, uh, there's more tool, tools at our disposal. If you have a strong majority government, you could have the greatest idea ever if that government doesn't agree with you. You almost have no, there's almost no tools available to try to change course or, or to do anything else. However, in a minority government, um, we have tools such as private members bills, which, which I will specifically unpack, but also opposition day motions, you know, committee studies and appearances, order paper questions, question period itself. And, and there are certainly deal making to be had. And that's from uh, party to party, but also uh, industry groups to, to individuals uh, as well to try to advance mutual priorities. Um, minority government also means that all the major parties are important. So you can't just focus, it's a liberal minority government, but if you just focused on the liberals and didn't engage the bloc, the NDP, the conservatives, the greens, um, you would not be speaking to a sufficient number of parliamentarians that could actually do anything. Um, so it does, you know, essentially mean we cast a wider net to include uh, all of those political parties. The challenges, yeah, legislative bandwidth is a big one. Uh, it just means that it's very difficult to get things done legislation wise, legislation being, you know, introduced in the House or in the Senate. Um, it's harder to do that. Uh, there's, there's a lot of competing priorities for that legislative agenda to, to be on the order paper and to advance. Uh, 
minority government, there's always a threat of an election. Uh, you know, journalists make a living here in Ottawa talking about uh, spring election or fall election. Um, that impacts timelines and the tools we have available, such as private members bills, such as committee studies. It, you know, when there's a minority government, it's almost like you're almost always on the clock. Uh, and MPs are also, uh, members of parliament are also, um, I think even more keenly focused on their riding because they have to, uh, you know, they have to go and interview every time that that election is called to determine whether or not they maintain the, their seat and, and their livelihood. Um, I, I don't think 2023 an election is likely fall. I mean, that's right here and now, you know, a week is a lifetime in politics. Maybe things will change this fall. Um, we have uh, elections coming in Alberta and Manitoba. Um, you don't tend to run a federal election at the same time as a political election. It's, you know, the media gets saturated. Canadians are confused. Ask them to go to the polls to vote for similar but different parties, federally, provincially. It just sort of not ha doesn't normally happen. Um, but prorogation, I think, is the, 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 I don't see the bigger threat, but the more likely. Uh, prorogation is when uh, the prime minister asks the governor general to dissolve parliament. It doesn't cause an election. Uh, but it does require Parliament to be dissolved, reconstituted with a speech from the throne to outline kind of new priorities. Um, prorogation kills all government legislation, so all those bills uh, get cancelled. Um, and there certainly are a number of big federal bills, I'd say, that you know probably aren't going the way the government intended. Uh, so you could see it as a, as a reset tool. Um, whoever prorogues always pays a bit of a price publicly uh, and with opposition parties, but to be clear, Stephen Harper prog, Justin Trudeau prog, Liberals prog, uh, uh, Conservatives prog. It, 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 it's a valid tool. Um, the one thing with prorogation is government legislation it goes away, but private members' business, private members' bills uh, can be returned and, and, and brought back at the, at the same legislative stage. So uh, if a private member's bill was at third reading uh, and a government bill was at third reading and they prog, they, they come back, that government bill is gone. But so long as that parliamentarian, whether it's an MP or senator, wants to that legislation to continue, they can bring their own bill back at that same stage of third reading, for example. Um, we have a supply and confidence agreement, much discussed, you know, in the media between the NDP and, and the Liberals. Um, that essentially means the NDP will vote with the Liberals on matters of confidence, which is budget, uh, budget implementation, supplementary estimates. It can also be anything that the government of the day deems as a confidence matter, whether that's deciding Canada is going to get involved in armed conflict or just something that the government feels is important enough to say we need to have confidence in the House of Commons in order to pursue the direction the government's proposing. Um, the, this agreement is supposed to go to 2025. It's essentially a back and napkin agreement, right? So uh, if if the NDP decided that it didn't work for them anymore, there's nothing stopping them. Um, but I think what's interesting in that, I know a lot of concern with, you know, they're just going to work together and everything, and they are on matters of confidence. Uh, but, you know, at this date and time of, of, of discussions, um, interesting, I think, to know that the NDP, I think, are looking to actually differentiate themselves on other issues that aren't matters of confidence. Um, and, and agriculture is a good example of that. Doesn't mean that we support everything, but uh, the agriculture uh, have a uh, critic and the NDP um, have been quite supportive of a, a lot of what we're trying to do as CCJ on behalf of canola farmers. So, um, and that's the same to be said with the block. Uh, um, the Bloc is also a party that is open to engaging with us. Um, and when I was a political staffer, uh, the Bloc was not interested in really engaging in anything outside of direct Quebec issues, nor were they interested in, in meeting with you if you weren't going to speak in French. Um, and I'd say the, the, the Bloc, since it's been returned as an official party and has seats on committees um, and under the leadership of their ag critic Yves Perron, that uh, they're very open uh, to engaging with, uh, with us despite Canola not having a huge presence in Quebec. Um, there certainly are, you know, down the value chain, Quebec support, food manufacturing, and, and, and et cetera. But um, so all that to say is minority governments, there's those opportunities that present themselves, such as working with other parties. Um, on the official opposition side, you know, we have Pierre Polyev. He won a massive majority on his first ballot. He then created a massive shadow cabinet. Um, and you might think, you know, governments on uh, the conservative side, you know, often advocate for smaller government. But it's tough to do that when it comes to shadow cabinet. This is sort of who, if he formed government, would likely be in cabinet. Um, the, the tough part about when he's been around this game long enough, as Mr. Polyev has, is it when he's grading his shadow cabinet or his future cabinet, perhaps, 
is you have to reward your old friends and the old faithful, those that have been with you from day one. Um, you have to bring new allies into the fold, uh, you know, rising stars, people in politically sensitive writings, um, you know, people that, uh, you know, perhaps it's a swing riding that's typically held by the, another party and, and they were able to win it. Um, and you also have to use it as a way to sort of alleviate previous frictions. Like we saw with Mr. Polyev's shadow cabinet, he actually brought in a number of the individuals that ran against him for party leader. It's a way to build bridges. It's a way to mend fences. Um, but all that to say is that it does make for a big group. And Mr. Polyev being in politics for as long as he has, it is a large group. Uh, and that's a large group of people to speak on your behalf. And uh, that can be a good thing, but it can also have some negative repercussions. Um, you know, I think there's been a lack of focus on, on monetary policy, uh, and we're seeing a shift in that, which is good. Um, I think in uh, 2020, we had the Healthy Environment and Healthy Economy Plan announced, which is December 2020. Um, and that led to the formation of the Agriculture Carbon Alliance, the ACA, which, which I will unpack. Um, as a result of that, uh, you know, it was a way to sort of work together in a different way um, because of that. Um, you know, there still remains uncertainty in the Senate, uh, you know, as we wrap up the sort of state of play. Um, the Liberals, uh, then Justin Trudeau was the opposition uh, leader in 2014, removed Liberal senators from caucus. So now in the Senate, you have a number of individual parties that sort of form themselves. The Conservatives are still there in their traditional party sense. We now have the Canadian Senator Group, the Progressive Senator Group, and the Independent Senator Group, as well as just independent senators. So the Senate is quite unpredictable because you don't have that direct connection back to the House of Commons. So every Wednesday in Ottawa is called National Caucus Day, where the Conservatives beginning at 8 or 9 a.m. get together regionally and then nationally with all the MPs, uh, as well as all their Conservative senators all get together in the same room when they talk about issues and priorities. Uh, the Liberals do that, as do the Bloc. But the Liberals, there's no senators there from the Liberal side. So about half the Senate is sort of off with no direct connection back to the House of Commons, um, which I think just makes it for um, a little bit less predictable. Um, and there's also less rules in the Senate around private members business. So again, just essentially just a lot of uncertainty. Um, you know, I guess, you know, the approach that we use in advocacy, you know, is, is one that, you know, we often hear if there's things that people don't like, you know, we should be on social media, um, kind of yelling from the rooftops or railing, railing against, but elbows up really doesn't work in Canadian politics and Canadian lobbying. Um, it really is uh, about kind of leaving it on the ice to use a hockey analogy. Um, question period is theater. Most members of parliament actually get along quite well uh, outside of question period. That's not really how the, you know, the day to day in Ottawa is really not defined by what happens from 2.15 to 3 p.m. Eastern, uh, Monday to Thursday. Um, and there are really good leader agriculture leaders across all parties. You know, I can't name them all, but of course, in the Senate, we have Senator Rob Black, who is, is certainly a longtime champion, Ontario Senator for Agriculture. Um, in the House, we have the House uh, uh, Chair, Cody Bloys from the Liberals, the Parliamentary Secretary, Francis Joanne from the Liberals, Shadow Minister uh, John Barlow, and Associate Shadow Minister uh, Warren Steinley, the NDP, Alistair McGregor, and the Bloc Epron. They all get together. They, 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 they want to work for the betterment of agriculture. Yes, we don't always agree on everything, um, but they, it is a good group. Um, you know, maybe just lastly, you know, I often get asked about, you know, why is the sort of the current state of play between um, Ottawa and the prairies the way it is? And I think it just comes down to numbers, right? Sometimes we feel that prairie interests aren't represented uh, in Ottawa. Um, when it comes to, it all really comes down to population and, and in our parliamentary process, we want to keep it to about 100,000 Canadians per member of parliament, which has led to increase of seats. We now have 338 seats. So when we look at, you know, why does Ontario and Quebec get all this attention? One, it's vote rich. Two, they swing vote. Um, and then in the in Quebec, for example, you could have a farmer that's voted for the Bloc, the NDP, the Liberals and the Conservatives. We don't have that same sort of party competition in the West. Um, in the prairies in total, there's also only 72 seats. Uh, Quebec has 78 and Ontario is 121. So those two provinces, when we often think of like they have, uh, their issues tend to be the ones that, that navigate up uh, channels to Ottawa. Um, a lot of it just comes down to 60% of all the seats in the House of Commons are from those two provinces. Um, so it's not insurmountable, just something we have to keep in mind as we try to advocate on primarily rural issues to predominantly urban and suburban parliamentarians. Um, you know, I guess the Rogers on the outset, Ottawa's crowded. It's never been more crowded. Um, 
sectors flocked to Ottawa during the pandemic lockdowns to advocate for their industry. Um, but they, they flocked to Ottawa virtually, right? Uh, previously, it was always, if you wanted to talk to a member of parliament and you were a constituent, you met them in the riding at the riding office to talk about constituent issues. If you wanted to talk about federal public, public policymaking, about legislation, about regulations, about the budget, you came to Ottawa and requested the meeting. You came in person, you go through airport style security, you likely flown to Ottawa or you, your organization or company pays to have an office space in Ottawa, you invest in Ottawa, kind of boots on the ground. Um, virtual advocacy was a first, like there was Zoom and Teams, you know, we all should have invested in, uh, in, in those, those platforms pre-pandemic. Um, what it has allowed, and in some ways good, it's allowed you know folks to bring their policies and programs forward to Ottawa, but it's also just inundated parliamentarians with requests. So these are just some numbers on the screen as to give you a sense, there's almost 3,400 lobbying organizations in Canada. There's over 8,000 registered federal lobbyists. And these numbers are outdated because the this is a 2021-22 report from the lobbying commissioner, probably close to 9,000 uh, federally registered lobbyists now. So it just shows you how are we possibly supposed to get cut through this noise, right? When we look at just the amount of people trying to advocate, you know, twenty dollars in a Zoom account now makes you can make you in some ways a lobbyist. You can bring your issues forward the same way as my team and I would walk up to Parliament Hill uh, with a footprint here, with expertise here. Um, and it's a hard thing to claw back. We also see, you know, members of Parliament typically don't deal with Ottawa issues when they're home, and they don't deal with home issues when they're in Ottawa, and all those lines have been blurred. Um, so it has benefited those of us who've been doing this a while, you know, having those kind of Rolodexes in place. It's really hard to get to know and meet people virtually. This is definitely a face-to-face -face business. Um, but that being said, you know, I think we have been successful. And in 2022, um, uh, 2022 for the first part, first off, it broke every lobbying record. There were 31,000 registered meetings with the federal lobbying commissioner. Uh, those are the meetings that I described earlier. Um, CCJ did the most meetings of any organization in Canada, regardless of sector, with just over 240 meetings. So we look at, we were the most active organization there, and we're not even a one one hundredth of a percentile point, right, of the number of total meetings. So it shows that it's not an inch deep, mile wide, it's, you know, a quarter inch deep and three miles wide, as far as 31,000 different people, 31,000 different communications on different issues, telling members of parliament, senators, ministers to do different things. Um, so how do you get above it is, uh, I'll get into that a little bit, but really it is, uh, being diligent to being there day in and day out. So the big issues, you know, I think right now working capital and competitiveness is, is certainly a big one, big one for us. Uh, and we'll get into bill two, three, four environment, sustainability, innovation, or, or say lack thereof as uh, I view Canada is falling down that kind of innovativeness, uh, you know, the OECD charts or UN or however you want to look at it, but Canada being a destination for investment, whether that's in new seed varieties, new chemistries, new molecules, new equipment. Uh, I think it's an area that we, uh, it's not in focus enough. Biofuels, my colleague Steve unpacked that, certainly transportation, international trade being the perennial issue given 90% um, of canola is exported, business risk management and the new Canadian Agriculture Partnership, SCAP, um, and then private members bills and there's some private members bills we really like uh, and there's some that we are more concerned with so uh, you know uh, instead of going through all of them I, I do want to talk a little bit about two three four for the next five minutes um so aca was founded in march 2021 it's actually now 15 national farm organizations um and we focus on key agri environmental policy issues so this was all came to be as i mentioned december 2020 um Healthy Environment, Healthy Economy plan comes out, which included the price on carbon at $170 a ton. Um, certainly very concerning um, from an economic standpoint, but how do we do this? How do we fight this you know, in a way that's not viewed as just philosophically opposed to carbon pricing? Um, so the idea was, can we bring everyone together? Supply management, grains and oil seed, fruit and vegetables, and can we bring back a private member's bill because it's a minority government and that, that's a tool available to us that would exempt on-farm practices for natural gas and propane for, from carbon pricing, the same way gasoline and diesel on-farm was exempted. So, and we started calling members of parliament, private members' bills. It's a lottery. You get 338 MPs, their names go in a you know, virtual hat, comes out. The top 30 of those names are very coveted positions because you really have a chance of uh, moving uh, your legislation through and potentially passing a law. Um, there's been two iterations of this bill. 
Uh, and we talked to Ben Lobb uh, from Ontario, uh, conservative, and he was willing to introduce this bill, an improved upon version of another bill uh, that Philip Lawrence had introduced. Um, bill 234 seeks to, to amend the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act. It seeks to um, uh, exempt natural gas and propane used for on farm production, um, food production for uh, rain drying, heating and cooling of livestock barns and greenhouses and other growing structures. Uh, as well as irrigation and, and feed preparation. It would remove the carbon price uh, that, that farmers are paying for all of that. So this is where we are. Um, ben Lobb again agreed. We introduced it uh, in February 2021, worked this office on drafting legislations, developed an advocacy strategy to support the bill at every stage. And I'm pleased to say uh, as of today um, that this bill is scheduled to be voted on uh, third and final reading in the House of Commons on March 29th. And um, that's, that would be, once it passes that stage, it would then get referred to the Senate. Um, so where are we now? So this has been something the ACA has supported from supply management through the livestock and, and fruit and veg. Um, and this is a bill that we received 170 votes in favor at second reading. And we're doing uh, absolutely everything we can to make sure that we get enough votes at third reading to get it referred to the Senate. This would be a huge economic relief for farmers. Just imagine, for any farmers listing, no carbon pricing for your grain drying bills or your, your heating and cooling of your livestock barns and greenhouses. Um, and this is a key tool that we have available because it's a minority government. So we're getting prepared uh, for the vote. Uh, we got taking out, a, that, that's an ad, uh, the vote for C234 uh, in the Hill Times, our parliamentary newspaper that'll be going out next week or the week after rather, uh, as well as a leave behind. And I guess the one thing I wanted to impress upon you today is that if this is something, Bill 234, um, uh, that, that you feel uh, would benefit your farm, or if you just are like myself, I'm not a farmer, I work in agriculture, I support agriculture, you could also consider sending a letter to your MP. We just launched the, this click and submit campaign. Uh, if you scan that QR code, it'll, it'll take you to a site that allows you to write to your member of parliament. Uh, there's a pre-filled in form there in English and French, either as a farmer or someone who supports agriculture, asking for your member of parliament to vote in favor of Bill 234 at third reading. Uh, Bill 234, again, will free up the working capital needed so that farmers continue to do what you do best and reinvest in your operations and continue to grow high quality food, feed, fuel, fiber that you know, feeds Canada and the world. Uh, and thanks, Jeff, you just put in the in the chat there, too. You can also click there if, you, you know, your phone's not working or you're watching this on your phone. Um, we have about 300 letters in so far. We just launched this week in earnest, and, and we're hoping we get some more so that MPs know that farmers and Canadians care about the, the economic competitiveness uh, of, of Canada's farmers. Um, I only have about five minutes left uh, before I turn it back to Roger for some questions. So, just start a bit of our lobbying and tactics, right? So this image is just, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Um, so the five sort of P's of lobbying that we, uh, that I like to call that our team does is, uh, and that sign is actually from uh, early in the Biden administration uh, when they were kind of concerned about the, the optics of lobbyists. There are certain parts of the White House that they were kind of cordoning off from lobbyists. Um, but first P being persistence. Um, you have to be there day in and day out telling your story or someone else will tell it for you. Ottawa is an echo chamber. So persistence, sometimes a squeaky wheel does get the oil, but we're there day in and day out telling our story in a diplomatic way. We're there telling our story about the opportunities that, that, that we have in front of us. We do talk about challenges, but we never raise a challenge which we don't have a well thought out, well sourced and, and, um, and reasonable solution to present. We do not go with complaints, we go with solutions. Um, being a lobbyist makes you inherently repetitive because you have to tell an MP what you have to say, remind them of what you said, and then follow up with what you told them that you said and what you asked them to do. Uh, so it does make you inherently uh, repetitive or, or so my wife uh, tells me, um, but you really do have to reiterate your message at every time because we had that one meeting, we spent 30 minutes in MP, there's 30,000 others of those meetings literally happening throughout the course of the year. Uh, so we have to be there day in and day out, day out which is why we are where we are um, located near, near Parliament Hill. Second piece, policy prioritization. And this sounds obvious, but it's actually very difficult. Um, not every issue can be a high priority at a high urgency. In a 30 minute meeting with a member of parliament, you do some intros, some closing, they usually wanna snap a photo. You book 15 minutes of maybe content you can deliver and then well, to allow dialogue. You have sort of three, three topics you can go into any meeting with and that can even be a stretch. So it doesn't mean that it's not important. It just means that we have to pick our battles. We have to pick our time slots. We have to be able to identify 
where in the political process are we that uh, and where do we put our political capital uh, to advance? You know, um, you can't go in with the laundry list of demands. It certainly just does not work, and uh, it comes off as not understanding you know how, how the political process works. Partnerships. So th th these are the logos of the Agriculture Carbon Alliance. They are all agriculture groups, but maybe some groups that haven't traditionally worked that well together. Uh, we agree on 90, 95% of files. We don't talk trade policy around the Agriculture Carbon Alliance table, but these are the people that we partnered with, these organizations who are located across the country in different provinces where there's more seats or less seats to work together on uh, an agri environmental policy. And these are the groups behind Bill 234 that uh, I co-chair the ACA with uh, Scott Ross from the Canadian Federation of Agriculture, and, and this is this is our uh, uh, what we've used to bring this bill forward that would benefit every farmer, every producer, grower, rancher, however you uh, identify yourself. Um, at CCGA, we also spend a lot of time working with groups like the Chamber of Commerce and others, so that yes, we're an agriculture industry, but we're also an industry and want to be treated uh, as such. Political realities, uh, you know, I mentioned. Uh, um, it's very, it's very easy to sort of be cynical about politics, but uh, you know, if we had come up with the idea for a carbon exemption for farmers and tried to work with the federal government, the, the cabinet on it, it never would have gone anywhere. They're opposed to extending exemptions. So sometimes you just have to recognize that there's no point argu arguing with the ocean about the tides, right? There's no point arguing with things that cannot be changed. Doesn't mean you don't continue to work in that space. Doesn't mean you don't work to continue to advance your issues, uh, but you pick your battles and you pick your opportunities. Um, and as I said before, sometimes the absence of a loss uh, is a win and we have to take that. Um, but we are really careful to not rail against something that is a foregone conclusion um, because we want to maintain our political capital. And that's a very tough thing to quantify or describe, but I can assure you that you know when you've run out of it, when people don't return your calls, your, your meeting requests, your emails go unanswered. Uh, could be because you, you kind of faltered and you, you, you know, your powder's not no longer dry and you don't have that political capital to advance other things. Public opinion, you know, perception is reality and what might be true to you is not true to others. Um, and, and the fact that just all politics are local, right? Uh, members of parliament and minority government are extremely sensitive to, to constituents. Uh, luckily, parliamentary, uh, uh, farmers rather poll very well. So it's an audience that we can certainly bring forward, but we have to recognize that how our issues line up and can we draw a correlation between the farmer issues we're advancing and what Canadians generally think about things. So the tactics, you know, it, it's similar. It's kind of the strategy, but how we actually do it. Um, our busiest times are September, December, and then February to April. Um, bad news tends to come out on Fridays from the federal government, you know, for Eastern before a long weekend. So we're always, you know, backs up a little bit right before those sort of things. Um, we do a lot of parliamentary monitoring. Our colleague Julia goes through everything that's happening in the House and Senate, so we're ahead of the curve. Uh, I mentioned we engage with our uh, with our partners. We understand. Uh, we keep a good pulse on our political capital to know you know how many issues can be advanced in a given time. Um, and then when it comes to lobbying directly, before before I close, I just want to say in the last minute or so that um, we disagree without being disagreeable. Um, uh, I always say that you speak to a member of Parliament about an issue that you vehemently disagree them, with them about, but you speak to them the same way you'd expect to be spoken to out in public with your family, or out at dinner with your kids. Um, doesn't mean that we're, we're not, we're not you know, pushing, doesn't mean that we're soft. It just means you disagree without being disagreeable. You focus on bad policy, not people. Um, you have to recognize there is a power imbalance and parliamentarians could just ignore you and there's not a whole lot we can do about it. But if we're there in good faith, uh, they do tend to want to engage. Um, and you we to embrace and support good policy regardless of who brings it forward, regardless of which party brings an idea forward. If there's merit to that policy, we should be advancing it. Uh, by the same token, if a politician that perhaps our constituents like brings forward a bad idea, we have to push against it. Um, tweets, news releases are not how backroom power brokers work. That's not how Ottawa actually works. Ottawa is a small town. People have long memories. People forgive, but people do not forget. Uh, people remember kind of every little slight, and those are things that we tried to eliminate. And then lastly, lobby day and reception. We bring our board um, this November, they'll be back in town for a full lobby day. It's really important that we do have that touch point on an annual basis that farmers are able to come and tell their story because uh, you have a lot of credibility and we want farmers to advance their story. And then just in closing, often asked what you can do as a parliament, uh, as, a, as a farmer, as an industry stakeholder, um, get and stay informed. Nationalnewswatch.com is a fantastic website. It's a news aggregator. It does not have any political leanings. It just 
whatever is trending in Canadian politics, it just moves around uh, based on clicks. The one thing I will say before I turn it back to Roger is that please consider on an annual basis, meet with your federal member of parliament and your provincial representative, 30 minute meeting with each once a year, build those relationships, all politics is local. You can literally bring a, an issue forward to your local member of parliament. Then the next Wednesday, they're back in Ottawa in regional caucus. And they say, hey, I'm hearing from my farming constituents a concern with this issue. Are others hearing that? Maybe get some nodding heads. And then when they go to national caucus with their leader or the prime minister, they perhaps as a caucus, Manitoba caucus, they will raise it. And that could be something that you've done. I just say that you never want to be building bridges when there's a fire, when there's a crisis. So please, 30 minutes once a year, consider going for coffee with your MP, your MLA, your MNA, depending on where you're on the world. Um, you know, consider running for national or provincial boards, support your preferred candidates in a lot of ridings that are very safe. The nomination is the battle, not the election. So if you think a candidate's going to do the best for you and your farm, please do support them in whatever way makes sense. Uh, and then just get involved in whatever way works best for you. And then just for uh, Sean Hay, just it's not all scotch golf and, and lunches. Uh, there is real work to be done. And uh, with that, I will pass it back to, uh, to, to Roger for uh, any questions. Thanks, Dave. Uh, as always, that was a very tremendous presentation. I, I think uh, most farmers are uh, completely unaware how the process in Ottawa works and, and all the work that goes on behind the scenes, um, not to mention just how important that work really is. Um, just a quick reminder to everybody that's on today, please remember to use the QR code to show your support for Bill 234. Uh, getting this bill, I think, is going to be a massive win for agriculture and for farmers in general. It's a uh, a tremendous ability for us to to keep money in our own pockets and like Dave says we can use that to reinvest in new technologies that will you know eventually uh help out in our emissions control but or anything else that we need so uh, you know that is a, a tremendous amount of work that Dave has done in this in the background to, to get an arrangement with all of the other farm groups and, and I think this is a massive win anyways we'll now move on to the Q&A portion of the session um, as I said earlier, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask your questions. Um, and we will hopefully try and get all of them before uh, we run out of time today. Um, there are a couple in there already, uh, Dave, that, I, that uh, I'll read off to you. Uh, Dave, would succession and future ag lending to the next generation fall under capital for topics in, impacting profitability? This will be a massive problem in the up in the coming two decades, given the price of land and the demographics of farmers, has CCGA looked into this issue? Yeah, it's a really good, it's a really important part of it. And uh, we actually just, uh, what, six months or so ago, actually extended our policy team to bring on a manager of business risk management policy, of course, obviously focused on the, the BRM suite of programs. But yeah, the real just the, you know, the, the cost of being a farmer, the cost of doing business, the cost of land transfer. Um, you know, we supported a bill, a CCJ bill C-208 from William McGuire, which is now law and being in, uh, enacted. So it'd be cheaper for Roger to sell his farm to me than to his kids. And that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So, yes, we certainly are working on that. When you get into broader taxation policy, it is a long term play to move things. But we certainly monitor kind of on farm debt uh, as a key indicator of the economic sort of resiliency of our farmers. And, uh, and those things just get, you know, uh, uh, compounded when we have things like the uh, rising carbon pricing, uh, but also uh, just inflation and, and and cost of land or cost of housing, all those sorts of things. So yeah, absolutely. But it is a uh, taxation policy and those sort of things are very broad and they're more than just federal, but yeah, it's certainly an area that we're engaged with and expect to be more so going forward. Great. Thanks, Dave. Uh, another question. Can you describe the characteristics that make a lobbyist successful? Any examples of what not to do? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, good lobbyists, you know, they kind of seem to be at every table, they, they have a spot at everything and they kind of seem to be kind of all around town. Um, I think that they tend to get along well with people regardless of their political affiliation, regardless of whether or not you disagree on certain policy issues, because you're not disagreeing with that individual, disagreeing with that individual as an individual, you're disagreeing with a policy idea. It is very different to say to someone, I fundamentally disagree with you is kind of aggressive as opposed to this policy objective, it's just not going to, you know, the unintended consequences for our constituents or our, our stakeholders. So it goes back to kind of disagree without being disagreeable, but it, a lot of it is just focusing on the issues, not on the individuals. Um, 
And I think things that don't work well is people who burn bridges. Ottawa is a very small town. Um, anytime you, you know, don't maintain the confidence, or you don't exercise sort of judgment. Um, if you get a reputation as being leaky, as far as like, you know, what I tell you doesn't stop with you, it's a really hard thing to recover from. Um, so I think the best part is I act the same way if I'm talking to a conservative, a block, an NDP or a liberal, right? It's the same message. Yeah, there might be slight nuances, but you know, if you're the genuine person as you come across, uh, it goes a long way towards people want to chat with you, even if it's about a tough issue, they want to engage with you, as opposed to, I don't want to meet with them. They're rude, they're obstinate, why would I bother? And I, if I was a member of parliament, I can simply say, no, we won't accept that meeting. So um, yeah, it's just you just try to be uh, uh, disagree without being disagreeable, I guess would be the, the highlight there, Roger. Okay, great, thanks, Dave. Uh, I got another question in, uh, how important is a coordinated voice from all farm groups. How do levy paying provincial ad national farm groups differentiate themselves from membership based farm groups that don't represent a large number of growers? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I know I think increased coordination is, is happening and it's good to see. Um, it is important. Um, it is good when we have provincial groups if they come to the, they do come to Ottawa around you know, events that do engage. Um, but it, I think the issue that we run into is that people are just different priorities for different groups. And that's fine. Um, but the more we're working together, the more we're coordinating on big issues, the better it is. And I think a good example of this, Roger, is Bill 234, where I know CAP was in Ottawa last week and their postcard has Bill 234 at it. And the fruit and vegetable growers of Canada have their national meeting in Vancouver this week and are talking about the support of Bill 234. So the ACA has been a way to do that because it's 15 national farm organizations. Everyone wants a voice. You know, there's farm politics in place. Uh, for sure. Uh, but the more coordinated we are on areas that we agree, the better. Uh, there are issues that we don't all agree on, and those are the kind of friction points. Um, as far as, you know, the other kind of industry groups, you know, that are maybe on the life science or the seed or the fertilizer side, um, I can say that we work well with all of them as CCJ. From just in my office here, there's only three of us from CCJ, Canola Council, Pulse Canada, Grain Growers, Canada Grains Council, Nutrient, we're all in the same office space, not office building, office space. You go up a couple floors, we've got CAFTA, we've got Fertilizer Canada, we've got the Cattle Association, Crop Life Canada. So they're all organizations that a text message, a uh, quick elevator ride up or down, and we can meet face to face. So, but the more we're working together and focusing on the 90% that unites us, the much further we get. And we do try to work out the issues that we don't agree on, often trade policy, but we do it behind closed doors. We're not doing it on social media, yelling at each other. Um, and those tough conversations are, I think, are easier to have behind closed doors. But we can certainly all strive to continue to do better, better coordinated, better messaging. Um, and I think I've seen improvements over my, uh, you know, since I left politics and and uh, started working in the agriculture space. We're more aligned than I think we ever have been. Still room for improvement, though. Right on. Thanks, Dave. Another question that just came in, and this one is a sort of a specific to a particular region, and I'm not sure if you can answer it. Dave or not, but it, uh, it's hi, Dave. I wanted to send a letter to my MP for Bill 234, but I currently do not have an MP as they step down and their seat will be filled by a by election. Until then, what can I do as a farmer? Yeah, that is tough. I mean, obviously, there are, there are across Canada, there's three or four sort of vacant seats for MPs to step down. Um, the only thing I can suggest is that if you know you where you live, uh, if doesn't have a member of parliament, uh, perhaps you have a business or a farm or another postal code that you're directly linked to, you could certainly send that uh, on that behalf. Um, there, it is unfortunate that, for example, in Candace Bergen's old writing, I'm sure there'd be a lot of letters from there, but it doesn't go to to anyone currently. Um, so, opportunities are la are are more limited. However, that being said, if you know if you do want to show your support. Uh, for this bill, you could also write a letter to MP Ben Lobb and, and suggest that your support for that, and he can he can convey those messages along. Ben is uh, the sponsor of the bill; it's his legislation. Um, so, in the absence of having an MP or having, you know, for Roger, for example, if you, your farm address was different than your home address, or your business address in town, those are all valid postal codes you could use. Uh, if not, consider just writing in a, a note to Ben Lobb, offering your support and, and where you live in the world, and uh, uh, that would be sufficient as well. Okay, great. Thanks, Dave. Um, this one's an interesting question. And this is one I find really interesting since I have started doing this. Uh, it is, can you describe the importance of farmers being involved in advocacy? 
Yeah, it, it's huge. And I think, you know, we, we were, you know, in, I remember November, Roger, when you're in town, right? And we kind of like, you know, we're this is what we're going to talk about the minister the next day. And um, it's different when I'm talking about something day in and day out, because I'm talking from a policy perspective, right? But when a farmer comes to town, you know, I'd say one, do it with your national organization, communicate with them so that, you know, they you have support and talking points or whatever you might need. But it's very different for a farmer to tell your story. And I'll just, you know, use Roger as an example. Roger being able to talk when he when he was in Ottawa, because I was Roger and I were in a lobby group together this November. I can talk from a policy perspective of what, what we're trying to do on behalf of farmers. It's so impactful and it's so powerful and so difficult to refute when Roger gets up there and says the 35 years since he took over his farm, the increase in productivity and environmental stewardship and biodiversity and you know his yields or whatever it might, whatever metric you want to use. That's irrefutable. That is your day to day. That would be like me telling the minister, well, I don't believe that you get to go with your family on Sunday nights for dinner. Like it's just, it's not something you can really push against, uh, back against. Um, farmers poll really well. You are a trusted demographic, certainly higher than lobbyists in the polling, but your story is your story. And it's you talking about how policies direct, directly affect the day to day of your family businesses. And that, that isn't power, that is powerful, that it's impactful. Um, so there certainly are times. There's certainly more technical conversations at the department level that doesn't really make sense to bring farmers to. But if we're having a roundtable with our federal agriculture minister, we want our hearing from farmers, not from the staff at CCJ, because we talk to her and her team all the time. Um, the only, my only request would be if you're going to come to Ottawa and, and you want to advocate directly or however you want to do it, just communicate with whatever group you're affiliated with, whether it's a provincial group or a national group, just to make sure that you understand kind of where things are in play, uh, where policies are, what bills are in play, um, and they can just help you, you know, get your bearings. But it, it, it's so impactful to bring farmers to Ottawa. I'm looking forward to November 7th, getting our, our 10 member farmer board back to Ottawa, run around on the hill, do 25, 30 meetings to the day uh, of farmers telling their story. It, it's incredibly important, incredibly powerful. Great. And I see that we've got one more question. Um, and this one's actually, I think, a, a timely one. Uh, hi, Dave. Great presentation. Do live demonstrations, pro or con, have any influence on our policymakers, or are they just simply viewed as a distraction and a nuisance? Like a farm visit or live demonstration in that regard, you think that they mean, Roger? I believe that's probably what they're thinking here, yes. It, it's very impactful. I know whenever we have the opportunity, whenever our, my team or I get an email from a member of parliament to their office saying, hey, we're heading out west, can you line us up with a couple of farms outside of Saskatoon or Edmonton or Calgary, wherever they are, those MPs or those even uh, even uh, departmental staff, they remember those visits. Because I think remembering that this is a largely urban suburban, you know, uh, house, the House of Commons, uh, getting out and seeing the sophistication of your equipment, the size and the scope, particularly of Western agriculture, on an acreage basis, the amount of sophistication that you have in your combines, your tractors, the amount of things that you have to do to get a crop in and then maintain that crop and get it off the ground, it pays dividends big time. Excuse me. You know, we arranged just in a lot in 2022 alone, half a dozen or so farm tours, both with the part ag Canada officials. Um, you know, we're hoping to do one with, uh, with some PMRA officials this coming summer. It's really impactful that they can actually see, because especially in, in this current context, we're talking about money and working capital and the investments that you're making to see, you know, the actual machinery that Roger's talking about, well, I need money in my pocket to invest in. It's really hard to wrap your head around as an urban or suburban Canadian and the actual dollars that go into the brand new combine or your new drill or whatever it might be. Um, hugely impactful. Uh, that, that being said, don't let it get in the way of you doing your actual farming. But anytime we get an MP out to sit in a seat, to stand in a barn, to stand in a shop, to talk to your, you know, your team, your hand, your, your, your farm hands, pays dividends big time because it just, it grounds them, right? It takes what is, um, you know, kind of an existential or what is a high level uh, ideation of farms. Some of these MPs probably haven't been for, to a farm since like, their grade one or grade three field trip. And they actually get to go see a farm. It, it is impactful. And I can tell you MPs talk about that stuff around town. Like, in reception, oh, by the way, I was at a farm. It, it's something that certainly pays off. And, and we're always, we'll go out of our way to, uh, to help line up MPs or ministers or department officials with farmers uh, wherever they are in Canada. Uh, and would encourage farmers if you're asked and you can swing it to please do it. Uh, it, it, it does, it does help for sure. And, and, and educating policymakers on uh, modern Canadian farming emphasis on modern. Okay, great. Thanks, Dave. We have one more question. And I think that's all we'll have time for today. Uh, maybe you can do answer this one relatively quickly, Dave. It's how important are more existential issues like food security, availability, cost to moving for issues. 
very important. However, all those things, and I don't want to sound flippant in this, uh, the government tends to get to seize itself on shiny new things. So food security is very prevalent right now. We're going to jump all over that. Eventually, the luster weighs off, and the concern is that then they jump to the next thing, the next issue, the next crises, and they leave a lot of kind of things hanging. So what we really try to do is use some of those opportunities to try to create some sort of process so that this isn't a six-month conversation that we continue to keep agriculture in focus. Um, so very important, but there's also even things like cost of living and, and food prices have a shelf life, you know, for lack of a better word, and then governments are inherently focused on the next shiny object. So we do try to remind them of all the, all the shiny things that used to be that had to get left behind. Um, so important, we also don't want to appear opportunistic and, and, uh, and that's something that's a fine balance, whether it's a pandemic or a war, we don't want to appear opportunistic, but we do want to use the opportunity to highlight the importance of Canadian agriculture whenever we can. Um, but usually when Canadian agriculture is in, in mainstream media headlines, it's often not for good reasons. Uh, and we'd like to see it there for, you know, for better reasons like productivity and exploring exports. But uh, yeah, it, it certainly is important. Great. Thanks, Dave. I think that's all the time we have for questions today. Um, I just want to say this concludes our webinar today. And remember, you can watch all three of them um, on uh, our CCGA's website, which is ccga.ca. Uh, this session recorded will be posted there next week. So make sure to follow the CCGA social channels to get notification when the recording is up. So thanks to everyone who took the time to join us today. If you have any further questions about today's presentation, if you didn't get a chance to write them in the, the Q&A, you can email us at communications.ccga.ca. As well, the provincial canola growers groups are always open to hearing from farmers feedback on how they can best represent uh, you on policy issues, both on the provincial and the national level. So if your comments are more general in nature, I would encourage you to contact associations. Again, thanks everyone for attending. Have a great day. Thanks Dave again for uh, for putting on a great presentation and for all the people that work behind the scenes to uh, get the technical side of this to work and uh, I really do appreciate everyone taking their time today. Thank you very much.